With the popularity of microservices, event-driven architecture, event sourcing, and tooling, the term events has become a little bit overloaded and is causing confusion. I'm gonna add some clarity about the different ways the term events is being used and for what purpose. Hey everybody, this is Derek Comartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. So there's generally three main ways that I either see the word event used incorrectly or in an ambiguous way. And it's almost always related to content, whether it be a blog post, tutorial, or a video about microservices and or event-driven architecture. Now, that does not mean that a microservices architecture is necessarily implemented in an event-driven way, because there's people doing things that are not that. But these are the kind of the, the three general ways that I see terms used incorrectly or just in an ambiguous way. So the first way is really talking about an event in an event source system, so event sourcing. The second would be referring to an event related to event carried state transfer. And lastly, when we're talking about event in terms of notifications. So I'm gonna explain what all three of these and the term event means within them and the differences between them. So I've covered what event sourcing is in another video. Check the link in the description for that. But to kind of go over quickly, the idea of event sourcing is that you're storing facts instead of current state. So you're storing things that have occurred within the system in an event stream that you can then derive current state from. So what that looks like is if we're talking about a product in a warehouse, instead of having a record that just represents the product in a warehouse, we're recording all the different things that happen to that unique product. So maybe for a particular SKU, we've received 10 product on a particular date, then we received five more, then we ship six out, and then we did a product adjustment. So we're recording all the different facts, the events in an event stream, as opposed to recording current state. So this means that your event stream becomes the point of truth rather than current state. Now where the confusion comes in and why the term event is often used um, incorrectly maybe in microservices is people often think that you need to be doing event sourcing this within a microservice to actually communicate that to the outside to other services. But that's not the case at all. Event sourcing, again, is this, is recording facts of your events as the, the point of truth. Now, so you could think of, you have your event stream, which is your database. Um, and then where the confusion comes in is that you can also sometimes, depending on the product you're using, use your event stream as a message broker. And this is oftentimes done because you're gonna build projections or read models from your event stream to build up to current state for reporting, UI purposes, whatever the case may be. But some products have the ability to actually turn your event stream into a message broker. So that's, I think that's where the confusion comes in is I see a lot of articles mentioning, oh, I'm doing event sourcing, but they're not really doing event sourcing. They're really doing what I'm gonna talk about next. So the probably the most common case I see of how events are being used is this, is event carried state transfer. And the idea here is that you have a particular service that's publishing events about state changes. And oftentimes this is done because you want other services to have kind of a local cache copy of some data that's owned from another service. So the reason why other services want their own local cache copy, let's say we have the sales service, a warehouse service, and a billing service, is that instead of having to make RPC calls via HTTP, gRPC over the network to sales, the issue here is that if sales is unavailable or has some high uh, latency or performance issues, we don't want billing and warehouse to be affected because they have a direct dependency on sales and generally for say getting data from them. So instead of having that potential issue there, the idea being here is that you have a local copy within billing, within the warehouse of data that you uh, need from sales. So instead of having to make RPC calls and go get data every time you need it, you have a local copy. So in order to have a local copy, this means you're using event carried state transfer. So sales, the producer, when something happens to, for example, a product that is within sales, the concept of a product, if say there's a price change of some sort, there's a price increase, then it publishes that event. That event is actually gonna look like something, potentially one option here, is it's just gonna contain the SKU, say ABC123, and then what that price is now, $85. And what that means is that price increase will be um, published and then consumed by both the warehouse and the billing. And with that, from there, each one has its own local cache copy of whatever data it needs. Maybe it cares about that event, maybe it doesn't. If it cares about the price, then it will update it. 
But the other option that a lot of people are doing as well is instead of depending on how the actual sales is making its state changes, it may not be that fine grain to even know that it was a price increase. Check out my video on task-based UIs and CQRS because if you're doing more CRUD related things, then you're not necessarily gonna know explicitly what happened. So in that case, you end up publishing an event like product changed or product updated to some sort. And rather what you're publishing is the entire new version of what that entity looks like. Maybe you're publishing the old version and the new version, but either way, you're publishing a lot of data that then these other services are consuming to update their local cache copy. All right, so the last thing here are events for notifications, which really relates to what I was just talking about uh, related to event carried state transfer. So the idea with events for notification purposes is you're just trying to tell other parts of the system that something happened. Usually the contents of the events are very slim, just with identifiers and not necessarily have any actual state within them. So what that looks like is if I go back to my example here of sales, let's say that we have that an order was placed. So that event might actually just look like, oh, here's order ID one, two, three. That was the thing that was actually placed and sent to the message broker. And then from there, maybe billing cares about that uh, particular event, but this is how it relates to event carried state transfer is because if people start doing this and no data is actually in the event and they want to update a local cache copy, what they end up doing is then making an RPC call back to the producer sales to say, okay, give me more data about this particular order. But then you're kind of in the problem again of not being able to update your local cache copy if there's an issue with sales. Is it available? Is it up? Is there latency issues, etc.? So that's how people often transfer into events for notifications and then start moving into event carried state transfer is for this particular reason. But I don't necessarily view this as the reason why you should use events for notifications. I think you should be using them for workflow. So I'll explain that. So when I'm talking about workflow, I'm really talking about long running process. And when I mean long running process, I don't necessarily mean um, days. It could mean days, could mean weeks. It could mean hundreds of milliseconds. And it's all about workflow in different services doing their required part of that workflow. And the key part though here is having boundaries correct that they don't necessarily need data from other parts of the system because they have the data that they need to complete their part of the process. So let's say sales has an order placed event that's published to the message broker and billing cares about that so that once it sees that there's an order placed, it already has the billing information to say create an invoice or charge the customer. Once it does that, it will then place an order build event. It will publish that to the message broker. Then the warehouse might pick up that order build and realize, okay, we're good to go. The, mess the order's been placed. We've built the customer. We've created an invoice. We can actually ship this out. So we're going to create our shipping label. So we say labels created and then sales picks that up. See, okay, our order's processing. We're in a good state now. So this is kind of event choreography and it's all just with event notifications. We're not passing around state. We're just using events for choreography. I have a video on event choreography and event uh, orchestration. So check out that video if you're more interested in, in how to use events for notification purposes. So hopefully that clears some confusion about the term event and how it's used in what context. In the context of event sourcing, an event is a fact. We're recording all these particular facts, events, as our point of truth. It's about data persistence. Event carried state transfer are events that contain state. This is generally to avoid consumers having to synchronously call producers to get data. Finally, there are events for notifications. You're publishing events saying something's occurred. And generally this is part of a long running process or workflow that other parts of the system will interact with via event choreography or orchestration. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.